So hi, I'm Patrick McFadden. I'm a Cassandra guy. I'm a Spark guy. And I'm here today to talk about both of those. I work at a company called Data Stacks. We do, uh, we do both of these. Mostly, it's Cassandra. We're an enterprise Cassandra company. So if you like Red Hat uh, to Linux, we're kind of like that. And my job at Data Stacks is I'm a chief evangelist which means I get to talk about the free stuff, which is really cool. Um, I've been a Cassandra user for four years now, and so I've known a few things about it. I've seen it good, bad, and ugly. I can tell you all the good things, I can tell you all the bad things. But today I'm just gonna talk about how to work it. So uh, this is a kind of new audience, I think, to this. So how many of you are actually have used Cassandra? Nice, how many have it in production? We're right on! <laughs> so much better. You know, I was in London last night. I didn't get that many hands. You guys are way ahead of the curve. Right on. <laughs> that is cool. So, um, and Spark is definitely cool right now. So we'll, we'll talk about this. Um, so let's let's get into it here. Um, if you notice, I made this. <laughs> um, this is the world of Apache Cassandra. It's an application database. An application database meaning it's probably driving something that you use every day. And if not, it probably should. Then you should probably get a life. <laughs> so things like Internet of Things, like collecting information from solar panels is a good example. Um, but also mobile applications and web applications. Uh, stock, financial trades, that, those things are all being done on Cassandra today. My favorite particular use case right now is Call of Duty Advanced Warfare, which if you're playing right now is on Apache Cassandra. And that's, a, that's the game right here. So that's, a, that's what's happening now. It's, and it's real-time applications. It's things that are going really fast. You know, when I pick up my mobile phone and I go, yeah, I got the really big Apple, by the way. Um, this is the bend? biggest phone ever. <laughs> It's not bending. <laughs> I've been traveling all over the place. Look, it's flat. Look, look. Um, but if it does bend, I'm okay. I got Apple Plus. I'll get a new one. Um, so when I pick up my mobile phone, that I look at applications I have running on here, like Spotify, and that's what's being powered by. You know, the, it, Spotify is powered by Apache Cassandra, and that's really kind of cool because that's making my life better, right? Because it doesn't go down. So whenever I want to listen to the new Cascade album, bam, I pop it up. And it comes up, and it doesn't it give me a 404, or where's a 500 error? So what is Cassandra? The few of you that already know, this will be a review. So Cassandra is a shared nothing database, meaning that there's no elected leader, there's no <coughs> master node, none of that. And that is really critical when you're trying to do uptime. Because when you have an elected leader or master node, that means that one node goes offline. What's, what happens to the rest of your cluster? It waits. So do they have your application? Offline. You had better hit start. <laughs> Are you going to tell me to rewind? <laughs> okay, good. So it's masterless and peer-to-peer. -peer. This was all based on the Dynamo paper, which was from Amazon.com. The guys there, some smart engineers. And they were trying to solve a problem. We have a shopping cart online. That's where all our money comes from. How do we keep that online all the time? And not how many nines can we get? How do we get 100%? Not four nines, three nines. I used, when I was a product guy, so I was an Oracle DBA. Anytime I had a product person come after me and say I need more than three nines of uptime, I would be like, first of all, you gotta talk to my Oracle rep, and second of all, you're gonna have to add some zeros to my budget. Because that's hard to problem solve. <coughs> it's a single point of failure. I got some amen stuff here. <laughs> yeah. And that's what I used to tell people is like, hey, Oracle scale is awesome, right up until I run out of money. <laughs> <laughs> so that's when I first started using Cassandra. I ran out of money. <laughs> and I was like, there's got to be a better way to do this. So that's when I started doing this. Um, and this is what I wanted. I wanted this line, this straight linear curve or linear line above my scaling. I did not want this to be, when I add new servers, downtime, redo, build some sharding into my application, I was doing that. Oh, I sharded like a champ. I sharded everything. <laughs> and what happened? You denormalize your database, you start sharding. Then what happens? The application developers really hate you 
because they're like, I can't do a join anymore. Yeah. Well, now that my data is all spread out, whenever I lose one server, a quarter of my customers are offline. Yeah. That's the way we build the system. <laughs> <laughs> they never got that. So, all right. So I want this, this kind of scaling. So whenever I don't know what my load's going to be, I want to be able to add nodes when I have to add it. You know, and plenty of times whenever you start a new product or a new project, you're like, people ask, hey, what's it going to scale to? Uh, we're going to get 10,000 users a month. Like, how do you know? What happens if you get 100,000? That big server you just bought isn't big enough. So what do you do? Go get a bigger one, right? I had a great relationship with HP. They would deliver a server within two weeks. That sucked, because I had downtime because of that. And doing a forklift upgrade on servers is a really bad idea. So this is a good idea. Um, so what about uptime? I mentioned that. This kind of uptime, there's only one way you're ever going to get 100% uptime. And that is being in two data centers. More than one data center. And I know this because I thought I would never have a downtime. I got the best data centers in the world. We had downtime. I had a tornado hit a data center in Virginia. I didn't know they had tornadoes in Virginia. <laughs> and it took it out. And that was right next to Amazon, by the way. And that happens. Things happen. There was a great talk by the guy who runs Yahoo's infrastructure. He has 24 data centers. And his talk will make you nervous if you run infrastructure. Things from squirrels and junction boxes to people hitting fire alarms and shutting down all the power to someone running through a truck through a data center. <laughs> exactly. When did you plan for that? <laughs> Never. Hey, all right, so when we look at page five where it says the truck going through the data center, what are we going to do about that? Never said that. So <clears throat> you just got to deal with it. Hey, if the truck goes to the data center or whatever, I don't care because I have another data center going. And that's how you get maximum off time. And Cassandra is built to replicate. It is, that is just default. One of, my, <laughs> one of my favorite questions that I see often on mailing lists sometimes or on IRC, how do I get Cassandra not to replicate? <laughs> <laughs> Use posters? <laughs> um, so, that's, that's a troll. So, that, I mean, that is, that is Pretty cool. It's an out-of-the-box experience. And, it's, and then we want that always on. So whenever I go to look at my Spotify uh, playlist, I want to see it. I don't want to have this, uh, well, I'll wait for a couple hours. No, I want it now. So this is an interesting graph, actually. This, is, this shows a failure mode that we introduced into a test system. We were doing 40,000 reads per second. Took one node out. We have this thing called uh, rapid read protection, which the nodes actually figure out what's going on. And you can see all of them rerouting all that information. And just right back to no one. So that's what you need in your application. You don't want to get up at 3 a.m. when it goes down. So how does all this work? So we're going to get, I'm going to touch on the replication. This is not, to be, not meant to be a deep dive into Cassandra internals. If you Google my name, you can find one. But I'm just going to touch on this. And why does it work? And how does it work for your application? So when a client writes data into a cluster, it is all done asynchronously. So it will write randomly, in some cases, to a node inside the cluster with more modern drivers now. Actually, the driver is a part of the system and will pick the correct server where the data should reside. But there's also a secondary effect. It's that the server that you pick, it's that server's job to asynchronously replicate to the other uh, replica sets in the cluster. So that happens asynchronously in the background while still acknowledging to the client. But across the LAN, we can also create one connection to the other data center and asynchronously copy there as well. And then that node's job is to asynchronously copy inside. You noticed I used the word asynchronous quite a bit? One that question, is. is this document-based database? No, it is not a document-based based database. Um, there are two document-based da databases. There's Couch yep. and Mongo. Yep. We are not that. Yeah, and Solar as well. Well, I could say there's Schema now too, but some, yeah, yeah, that's an indexing system. It's not a database, so. Um, we are a column family database, but I'm glad you asked that question because okay, well, I'm going to wait. I'm not, yet, I'm not glad yet, but you will be glad you asked that question because I have the next. <laughs> Let me finish this one. Yeah. So with this replication going, with the replication factor of three, you get this maximum protection. So I have 
things going on over here, things going on over here, three copies on this data center, three copies in that data center. Tornado hits this one, no problem. Tornado hits this one, no problem. Netflix uh, in the United States has a great talk about how they run their $55 billion company, Active Active, on Cassandra. They have, on the western part of the United States, a data center, and the eastern United States, a data center. So, if a meteor takes out one half of the country, I still get to watch movies. <laughs> so, I'm glad you asked that. Here's your data model. <laughs> so, it is a fully schema database. So, you create a data model. Um, see, I always get plastic, never get bottles. <laughs> So whenever you have a data model in mind, you know, throwing a random document at your database, in my opinion, is a recipe for disaster. Um, I prefer schema. Like I said, I'm an Oracle DBA. Um, you can't take that out, it's still there. Uh, but I, I apply those methodologies to what I do in databases. I need schema. So when I see this table that I create here, I have fields, columns, and I have types assigned to them. Did well, you, did you yes. test it against the Mirror DB engine? Have I done it yeah. on the Cassandra engine for yeah. MariaDB? Yeah. I have not personally, but it yeah, there is a connector there uh, for underlying Maria. No, no. Did you test the performance? <laughs> did I test it against MariaDB? Yeah. Uh, I don't think it really compare. That's that's a secret of the There is actually a Cassandra engine for MariaDB. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's what I thought you were talking about. Um, so when I look at the schema right here, I mean, I get really interesting uh, data types, but I also get complex data types, like a map, and key value, and I get a set. And that's really helpful in my application design, so I can build out complex and simple data sets. So uh, primary key sets up uniqueness, and this is just the basic of running um, a entity table in Cassandra. Now you can't do join, so what we have to do is more complicated and somewhat interesting data sets like denormalizing your data. But, oh man, you told me this would happen. There we go. This isn't my clicker, by the way. So now we have these new things in Cassandra 2.1 that will really help you. Like for instance, creating types. Now we can create new types for your data model. And so you can do complex data in one place. When you denormalize, you can still have a really complex structure. Now what does this open up the door for? Um, you could do things like this. Uh, you could have your video metadata, which is like your height and width of the video, and the bit rate, um, embedded inside of your table. So instead of having to do joins to pull that data together, you're doing it in a denormalized set. This is a very fast way of doing that kind of data. Now, if you notice, there's this keyword frozen in here, which is borrowed from Ruby. That means that it's an immutable set, that it can't change. You can't change the address type. For the, sorry, the video metadata type. So what kind of interesting data models can this lead to? How about storing JSON? So this is an actual real world example. This is a product catalog, it's in JSON format. And so what I did here is I created a type called dimensions, which fits this part of the JSON field. I created a type called category, which fits uh, many of the categories. And then here's my table uh, creation. I have my dimensions, which is uh, just a uh, a single type, but then also I have a map of categories now. So I can have one or many categories assigned to that particular product. And I can store now store JSON directly in Cassandra, but it's fully typed schema. And that really makes a difference for <coughs> you. Not really sure what you're putting in your database and you need schema. <coughs> 